Okay, we're back. I knew I was going to go over 10 minutes, so I figured with the phone ringing twice, we just shut it off there. So, we're now going to talk about that um, funky side group with the sulfur in it. Um, you can make a disulfide bridge or a disulfide bond between two amino acids that might be near each other. This only happens with the help of an enzyme, and it's going to happen in a part of the cell called the endoplasmic reticulum. We'll talk about those later. This is a covalent bond, so this is going to be a very strong bond in between the amino acids that will come to hold the proteins together. We'll, we'll talk about that again in a little bit. The main bond that you're going to see holding a protein together is called a peptide bond. It's another kind of condensation reaction. We're going to get a oxygen over here, hydrogen, and a hydrogen from the, the nitrogen, um, the amino side. And then we're going to hook one monomer, one amino acid, up to another amino acid. We're sort of going to go in that head to tail, head to tail, um, orientation. We always move in the same direction. You'll always have the carboxy end of one attaching to the amino side of another and that makes a peptide bond. Again a covalent bond requires an enzyme to make it and we're going to keep growing this chain to link all our monomers together and this is called the um, nitrogen carbon backbone of the protein. So here's another way of looking at it. So um, here we've got car hmm, cut off. Let's start with this one. NCC, amino group, central carbon, carboxy group, that's a double bond to oxygen. Here's the next amino acid, NCC. Again, bonded with the peptide bond to the next one, NCC. So here's our backbone and you have single amino acids. This is said to be the primary structure of an amino acid. It's the direct, just linear relationship of those amino acids. The DNA actually codes for this. So the DNA has the information that says, put this amino acid here, put this amino acid here and link them together. Primary sequence. Um, secondary structure, so I, let me tell you first that there's going to be four levels of protein structure. Now we're on part two. So after you have that linear sequence put together, you have all the peptide bonds between each amino acid, you can now have more shape start to take place in the protein. And it all has to do with the chemistry that's coming together to attract maybe the, um, the polar um, hydrogen bonds together. And in this case, that's what we need to talk about here. So secondary structure is making these two different kinds of structures. One's an alpha helix, the other one's a beta pleated sheet. Any given protein does not have to have both of these. It might have just one, it might have a mixture of both, it might have none at all. It just depends on the sequence. And I'll talk a lot again about this in class. So here's the secondary structure, the alpha helix. So here's our NCC, repeating NCC, you can kind of see it winding through. And then because of the type of R group that's forcing it in this direction, you might get hydrogen bonds between amino acids in the backbone. Again, I'll talk about that in class. I might need to show you some stuff. And then the beta pleated sheets, here's it going one way, here's it going the other way. Here's our anti-parallel idea again. And then between the different backbones, you can have some hydrogen bonds across there. And this looks like an accordion pleat. The next level of protein structure is tertiary protein structure. So now my beta pleated sheets that's here and my alpha helices here, separated by some kind of unstructured sequences, start to coil up and sort of glom together in a ball. So basically now the R groups are attracting each other to make some bonds across the space. I think we're going to have a better picture to help you see that. No, nope, we don't. So it's actually the chemistry of the R groups, and I'll show you a good example with my telephone cord in class tomorrow. Um, interactions between the R groups then start pulling different things together. So what kind of chemistry can go on? It's all about the R groups and what kind of chemistry they brought to the um, sequence. If you had a cysteine, you might be able to make a disulfide bridge. Remember, those two sulfurs can make a covalent bond. Hydrogen bonds are likely to form between those polar amino acids. When you had an OH hanging off an R group, you can now get attracted to another one. Hydrophobic R groups want to get away from water. So the hydrophobic R groups are going to 
um, bury themselves maybe in the inside of a protein. Again, I usually use my hands to do this, so I'll show you in class. And then there's my husband calling me. Phone call. So we were talking about the different kinds of interactions that are holding the R groups together and making the tertiary structure or maybe the globular big clumpy structure of a protein. Um, hydrophobic side chains like to get away from water, so they're going to just force themselves towards the middle. Van der Waals interactions are the kinds of things that are happening between the hydrophobic side chains. So remember those kind of weaker forces. And then finally, we can have ionic interactions between those full-on plus and minus charges on the R groups uh, form what are called salt bridge or just basically all the ionic bond. So this is what I'm talking about. Um, you've got a protein going on here. It's this whole thing going on here. We've got some alpha helix over here. We've got some beta plated sheet over here. And then maybe there's an interaction between this strand here that they have in green and this strand over here that's the brown and those could be this hydrophobic interactions or attractions over here this could be a uh, uh, electrostatic interaction the uh, plus or minus attraction or this could be the hydrogen bond so in this area you could have all these different things with the r groups pulling those so those chains of the protein together this is what it might look like in real life so here we've got these ribbony looking things. This is beta pleated sheet. Um, the coils in blue are alpha helix. This uh, gray is just the linear chain that gets pulled over near something else that just doesn't happen to have this other extra structure to it. Um, so if I look at, um, let's see, this area right here, you can see that gray line. That's amino acids represented on that line. And maybe there's a bond happening between an amino acid that's hanging off of that alpha helix. Again, this is something better shown in class, so I'll reiterate it again then. I'm going to skip the denaturing stuff to deal with in class. The last level of quaternary structure is, uh, the last level of protein structure is quaternary structure up to number four. Not all proteins have this. This only happens if there are multiple separate subunits that come together, meaning that there are four separate polypeptides, or, or in this case four, or just separate polypeptides that come together. So anytime there are two or more held together to make the final functional protein, you have quaternary structure. So not every protein is going to have this. This picture down here is of hemoglobin, our favorite sort of poster child for protein structure. I've got a lot more to show you about this in class. So the alpha subunits, there are two of them. Here they are in blue. The beta subunits, there are two of them. Here they're colored green. In the middle is what's called a heme group. This is a, I have a picture of it coming up. This is a um, organic molecule that has an iron in the center of it, and that's actually where you bind and release the oxygen. Um, here's the heme group over here. I just made the chemical structure of it here. So lots of double and single bonds. We've got nitrogens in the center, and they are, it's said that they're coordinating or holding on to an iron atom there, and that's what's going to get oxidized and reduced and carry the oxygen. So this heme group here is these things in the plane, one, two, three, and four. And here they color coded it with four different colors. We've got a yellow subunit, a pink one, a blue, and a green. Alpha helix are the coils. Not lots of beta pleated sheet in hemoglobin, actually lots of uh, alpha helices. And one more picture, although I like my pretty colored one better over there. Again, showing you quaternary structures, in this case, is four different subunits. Could be two, could be three, could be more. Um, in class, we will um, discuss um, this denaturing experiment together.